so much for coming to my talk and having open um, discussions um, about the gut. It's such an emerging new field, and we're learning so much. And even today's talk is just a sliver of what's going on. I have a new Twitter, and I'd love to put up new gut updates, so please follow me on there. Um, and I like to share a lot of uh, secrets I learn about the gut there. So my talk is called um, Resavaging the Gut to Solve the Identity Problem of Our Modern Dyspeptic Gut. Um, a, a famous gut researcher, Ostaff, he said, we survived, we survived because we adapted to a world of microorganisms. Because literally, uh, microorganisms are all over us. Um, they make up 100 trillion um, organisms in our gut, um, whereas we are just uh, only 10 trillion cells. So 90% of actually humans is actually um, bacterial um, microorganisms. We're like hybrids. And four, four of these water bottles is two kilos. That's how much bacteria we have on our body. So it's quite a bit. Um, so we have, um, they have 10 times more cells and 150 times more genes. So they are able to do much more biochemistry than us. Um, and that's why they digest a, a great deal of our food and we derive energy from it. So they're all over us in every nook and cranny. They direct and guide practically every part of us, and new research is emerging all the time showing how they direct our thoughts, our minds, how we look, our phenotype. So when I talk about microorganisms, I'm talking about the, the beneficial ones, the symbionts, our, our mutual commensals that live on us um, through the millennia. I call them probiotics. Um, technically, they mean life-giving organisms, and they're all over. Uh, here, oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, here are tiger nuts. They are central to our history, actually, for our diet and maybe even expansion of our brain and development of this AM, AMY1 gene, the amylase uh, gene that allows us to break down more plant, plant, plant polysaccharides like carbohydrates. Um, and they're all over. They're in the dirt. They're from cows. They're in raw milk. Some of the best bacillus um, strains help us break down gluten and casein, uh, proteins found in sourdough, um, gluten breads and dairy, A1, A2, casein, and that can cause quite a lot of gut disruption for some people. But when we have these organisms, they secrete the enzymes to help break it down. So a lot of people who follow the gut protocol that I have, they can tolerate gluten and dairy again. I'm not saying that these should be paleo, but they give us a much better buffer, especially if we have more intolerances like celiac or somewhere in between for silent celiac. So let's go back to the history. So a couple hundred million years ago, human, our, hum, our ancestors were uh, synodonts, and they were carnivorous. They had a carnivorous gut, which required wicked juices, a lot of acidity, uh, a lot of um, uh, things to break down just raw meat. And these were our, our pre-mammalian ancestors. They, they pretty much had everything that mammalians had. They had a heightened sense of um, hearing, sight, um, and smell because they live nocturnally. They had to stay away from all the Jurassic dinosaurs that were trying to kill them and eat them. And they even had glands out of their skin that secreted milk, um, a milk-like substance. And it's believed that these were probably antimicrobial, and I believe that they probably were full of probiotics because that's how uh, breast milk is. It's actually not sterile, as some early scientists thought, but it's full and rich of over 700 different species of our gut bacteria. Um, and they had hair, they had heat, body heat, they're getting higher metabolisms, um, and many other features that were wonderful. 200 million years ago, um, these evolved into mammals, our early ancestors, and at the Jurassic, they all died. So 70, uh, except for mammals and some other creatures, but 75% of species on Earth died, and this radically changed our gut, because no longer were we carnivorous, we became herbivorous guts, and things changed. Our hindgut became longer to become compost um, bioreactors to break down more food and from plants. 75% of Earth is actually plant polysaccharides. And no doubt, when we took to the trees, our guts took advantage of this because this was most of the food that we ate. Um, stems, leaves, fruits, a little bit of fundivory, like insects, um, but mostly fiber. So our colons got really long and bulky. And then Artie came along. That's one of the first skeletons that showed that we were bipedal. And by returning to terra firma, to the ground, we became reassociated again to soil organisms. Soil organisms are innate to our gut. They did many things. They, they um, help break down all our food, produce lots of butyrate, which is like air for our gut. Our, our gut would suffocate if it did not have air, if it did not have butyrate. And studies show that without butyrate, the gut will atrophy, and soon many diseases and inflammatory conditions um, will ensue. So Artie was one of the uh, first soil 
walking um, uh, hominids. And the next one that changed our history is Nutcracker Man, who learned how to dig. He had tools a little bit. Um, and his brain, his, he lived for a million years on Earth, and his brain grew quite long, bigger during that time. And it's, some researchers believe it's because of the starch that he ate in uh, the C4 tubers. At the t time, there was a ridification. The air got a lot drier. And um, these C4 grasses and sedges started to proliferate. And the tubers um, were rich, actually, um, in a new form of polysaccharide, a starch and a sweet one, um, because it would help protect against cold and drought. Um, these were sweet tasting. So naturally, I think our, uh, one, our early Australopithecine um, ancestors started to eat a lot of them. They taste kind of raisiny or sweet and caramelly. I believe he also probably started roasting them, but there's not clear evidence of that. So he lived quite a while, and by eating, nut cr um, by eating tubers that were called tiger nuts and other sedges that were tubers, um, he got carbs and protein. So tiger nuts actually, like other nuts, they actually, actually have quite a bit of protein. So he, in a way, returned our gut back to a carnivorous gut, but these, these were vegetarian sources. And tiger nuts are also rich in RS2. Anyone here into potato starch? Potato starch is RS2. So we have some ancient roots to eating some raw starches, and they, they jive with our gut. We do quite better. I've had a lot of clients do really well um, with different um, starch granules like green banana flour and raw potato starch because they help fire up our gut. And this is partly why, because of the history. Now, as we continue on the path of history, Homo erectus um, came along. And for almost two million years, even substantially longer, um, he reigned on Earth. He's also known as uh, Turkana Man and Java Man and Beijing Man. So he had a huge radius um, of geography across the Earth. And he hunted. He roasted um, dwarf elephants and bison. He returned, I believe, our gut to the true omnivorous nature. And in doing so, he expanded our, our gut brain axis, and our brains got bigger, and he gave rise to the next segment of human life, um, Homo um, neanderthalensis and Homo um, sapien us. And here with the Ice Age, uh, things radically change. So on Earth, there's been five major extinctions, and I believe the same analogy occurs to our gut. We've had massive changes over the last um, just 100 years alone, but it started with um, agriculture 12,000 years ago. So like Earth, um, we've gone undergone these extensive changes, and they change our health. They change our phenotype. They change our inflammatory status in our brain even. So the first one, it all started with uh, the Neolithic at, at the end of the Ice Age, um, and only Homo sapien was left after Homo erectus died out at 70,000 years ago, and Neanderthalonis died out about 35, 25,000 years ago. So with gluten grains, um, I believe that kind of changed a lot. Also, we reverted to more of a, a less of an animal-based um, system of food, which probably changed um, many things. As you know, we have so many fat, soluble nutrients in there, um, including omega-3. Now, the next massive extinction didn't occur until more like um, maybe the last 100 years, although cities have been uh, increasingly um, uh, grown in the last uh, couple thousand years, but it's really the more the modern cities where we have a lot of concrete and less exposure to soil and locally um, grown foods, gardens, no more village gardens. And without those, um, our, our bodies that have co-evolved with a, a core microbiota don't have exposure to these soil microorganisms. The next is electricity. It brought along with the refrigerator and our grandmas and aunts and other you know, community members, they stopped fermenting food. My parents actually grew up in Taiwan. They didn't have much electricity or even running water or a toilet. They had an outhouse. And a lot of their food was actually fermented. And this is actually the natural, normal way of life, except for the last, perhaps the last hundred years for um, most countries, um, except for the industrialized ones. Sliced bread. Did this not kill our gut? So now we have gluten. We don't have sourdough ferments with um, some spores from bacillus and other uh, soil organisms that help us digest food and um, prompt um, anti-inflammatory compounds and more butyrate in our body. But now we have this processed food, no more probiotics, and sliced bread, which is full of gluten, and more hybridization of wheat because people love gluten and it's so addictive. Um, so the fourth major extinction is really the one I think that is killing our gut. Um, about 80 years ago, livestock started um, to be given special feed with low dose um, antibiotics. It was discovered the antibiotics fattened the animals up. 
So in doing so, some of the uh, drug probably stayed in their system and then entered into our, blood, uh, our water supply and um, run off, and then it's in our soils. But it changes the soil ecology. So now our soils no longer as healthy either. But this later, the antibiotics went into our healthcare supply. And now, uh, so many doctors give it out like candy, and it wreaks absolute devastation um, into our gut. There was a Russian scientist um, a couple years ago in 2008, Sekharov. He showed that by giving low-dose antibiotics to mice, um, even though the total bacterial count did not change, there was a radical change in the composition. Uh, no longer were there so many of the good commensal bacteria, but there are a lot more uh, pathogens. Um, and then when the, he exposed them to salmonella, many of them could not resist the colonization compared to the original composition. So antibiotics, although they're lovely to help treat, you know, a sinus infection or shigella, or um, they're probably not the best things for our gut. And especially if you've had 10 rounds or six months worth for um, like tetracycline for um, an acne condition. So your acne may get better, but now you've ruined, um, the gut is now like a, a wasteland with um, many endangered rainforests. Um, and then lastly, I mean, obviously there's many other gut disrupting um, factors, but um, I, I think the fifth one is more tremendous because now we have new generations of children born with um, not much gut flora. And I'll be showing you a couple slides to illustrate that. Um, maybe their mom didn't have it or they had a C-section birth and did not get the full spectrum, the broad spectrum. We usually call that for uh, pharmaceuticals, but the broad spectrum of probiotics that mom provides protect the baby um, for quite a long time, um, despite the baby not having an immune system. And now we have baby formula. So again, the, the uh, breast milk is not sterile, but formula is, and they're, they're lacking um, a lot of vital um, organisms like lactobacillus and bifido. Um, and lastly, super sanitation. That's just the end, end cap on it. So. Today we have a modern gut, it's very confused, there's discordance and a mismatch. Um, when we lack the barrier that's pr protected and even produced by our gut bacteria, um, what happens is a lot of imbalance and a breakdown of the barrier, bacteria and my other microbes like yeast can translocate into our bloodstream and to even other organs. There's conditions like chronic fatigue syndrome where proteins of microbial origin are just clogging, clogging the brain. Normally there's very little proteins and in chronic fatigue or other uh, symptoms, uh, syndromes like autism, there's sometimes over 800 foreign proteins of all of gut and microbial origin. So hopefully by looking at the gut and learning more about it and ways to treat it or to re-savage it, rewild it back to our original origins, we'll be able to overcome a lot of these conditions like IBD, irritable bowel syndrome, gut syndromes, um, brain and skin um, conditions, joints, and mostly uh, inflammation and cancer um, and heart disease. So for one condition, in inflammatory bowel disease, there's been a lot of study on it. Um, Ms. Dr. Fedorak and his colleagues um, in 2006, they produced um, a study. They've also done some real-time sort of um, analysis of the gut microbiota. And you can see from early on, even within birth, um, these, uh, there's a tremendous difference. Within weaning, the pathogens, these are, I call them renegades, because once they take flight, um, because they're not held in check by our gut guards, the commensal um, ones, they have altered behavior and they become more um, aggressive and uh, break down our, our, our gut barrier. But E. coli, some ruminococcus and enterobacter, they are much higher either, even, even within days of weaning and they, it continues that way um, through the disease presentation. And in this population, when you compare it to a healthy control, you can see very on within just days, they lack certain gut commensals. Um, these are part of actually our ancestral core of microbiota. And just within days, they don't have it. And at weaning, they still don't have it. And throughout life, they are missing the, the core commensal microbiota. Um, so in, in trying to find out what is the ancestral microbiota, I went back into looking at um, data, poop, <laughs> fossilized poop. And it does, cop coprolites, they're called coprolites, and they do y yield a lot of clues. So really interestingly, um, in uh, a rural part of northern Mexico, uh, 1,400 years ago, they found some fossilized um, samples. And interestingly, almost half re represent a rural uh, traditional community like Western um, Africa, an area known as Burkano Faso. Um, and yet they still had some primate gut um, bacteria similarities. So I think that harkens back to what um, Professor uh, Blaisdell was talking about um, with our origins with the primates. 
and um, the other sample had a little less. And then looking at um, data from a mummy captured in ice um, 5,300 years ago, he also had a very herbivorous gut, a lot of fiber, apparently, and um, microbes very similar to a uh, primate gut. And that was even longer, further ago. And then if you look at less than 100, about 100 years ago, um, much less, all much less. And I, you know, we don't know anything about these individuals. We don't know if they're healthy or not, but these are just, I think, interesting tidbits of data. So if we look at Burkina Faso, there was a PNA, PNNA, NAS study done in 2010 by De Filippo. They compared the gut microbiota of children in Europe and compared it to children in Burkina Faso. And this is land which is very, um, kind of an ancient geo geography. They, they eat whole foods, you know, they process very, very little things. Everything is local and sustainable around their, their village. They, they eat a lot of millet and sorghum, whole grain, and a lot of black eyed peas, uh, legumes, some chicken. And during the rainy season, they have an interesting probiotic that they eat. Can you guys guess what it is? Termites, yes. So when they compared the gut microbiota, they had a lot of unique probiotics, gut microbes, that happened to come also from termites, because termites have a gut and they have a microbiota. Um, so, um, and these bacter bacterioids are very important. They produce, they break down a lot of starch for us. And in the end, I'll tell you about um, one probiotic which can help supply it. We can emulate actually eating termites. Uh, very interestingly, the, the healthy Burkina Faso kids had three times fold um, bacterioids and actinobacter. These are all soil-based. Even more intertelling is that their gut was really healthy. They have four to five times more butyrate, which is the anti-inflammatory um, uh, molecule, the uh, short-chain fatty acid that we all need in our gut. It supplies energy to the gut, as well as being um, a substrate for ketones. Oh, that was meant for Jimmy. He's not here. Um, so we need butyrate, we need a lot of it. Um, it's anti-inflammatory and it's linked to a lot of benefits um, for healing and keeping the gut barrier tight without letting pathogens through. More interesting is that children in Europe had three to even 10 times more um, renegades, pathogens, um, more E. coli, Salmonella, Shigella, Klebsiella. And as we know, they, they had much less bacterioids, one of the core members of our ancestral gut. So I continued searching, and there's a, a really a wonderful uh, gut mi microbiota researcher named Julian Tapp. He was also curious to know what is the core phylogenetic microbiota in humans. So he took 17 healthy humans, um, nine uh, omniv omnivorous um, in, from France, and eight vegetarians from uh, the Netherlands. And he compiled um, some data. 66 OTUs showed up out of the thousands of species available. Um, OTUs are operational taxonic, uh, taxonomic units, and they just mean species or really tightly grouped related species. And bacterioids came out really huge. They're a huge part of our gut. Numerically, they're one of the most abundant or the uh, but most abundant. But there were bifida, which um, normally we find in children, but they're actually in adults, especially healthy adults. And clostridia, cluster four, um, and 14A, and again, the bacterioids. Um, studies um, have been done by other people. Um, there's a researcher named L80. In 2013, he found that tolerance to pathogens are completely reliant on the uh, percent population of these two groups. So in modern diseases, we have a fingerprint of disease, and it's all based on the microbiota. In two human studies um, regarding diabetes, just by looking at the microbiota alone, they can um, fingerprint and determine um, reliably and characterize who is diabetic and who's not. So we can see va vast extinctions of, our, of some core ancestral microbiota in every disease, from type 2 diabetes to obesity. And these aren't considered gut diseases, like IBD or irritable bowel syndrome, but these are clearly um, gut diseases. And the same goes for celiac and rheumatoid arthritis. And you can see the pathogens are very, the renegades um, have taken over. And here you see lactobacillus, but there's actually different kinds of lactobacillus. There's good lactobacillus and bad lactobacillus, um, and probably likely these are the not so great ones. So I have to bring up the F word, sorry. I hope I didn't punk you guys because I called the uh, slideshow um, re-savaging the gut. <laughs> but I'm talking about um, plant polysaccharides. You know, we've introduced, or we have these gut microbiota um, in our guts, living as co-inhabitants in our gut. Um, yet, you know, it's just like taking home uh, an animal from the Humane Society. If you don't feed it, it's gonna die, right? So we have all these special core microbiota and they need to be fed. So, of course, they all eat fiber, but they also love starch. 
So many studies now show they even like starch even as much as regular fiber. Um, and if we look at a cup of romaine, who loves, who loves salads here? Great. But two cups of romaine is only two grams of fiber, whereas if you have a roasted tuber that our ancestors roasted since last, like the last one million years at least, um, how much grams of resistant starch, cooked resistant starch, is in a roasted tuber once it's cooled? About 20 grams. That's 10 times more. So for the gut bugs, they just go nuts. That's much better than stems and leaves and um, um, even fruit. But a lot of our gut bugs, they do, like, they're cross feeders. This is a happy little community. So some do well on one fiber, and then they feed others. So it's kind of like the butcher. Like, for instance, ruminant coccus bromai, he's like the butcher. So if your butcher in your village goes on vacation, can you eat much beef? It's, it's really difficult. So these um, help to break down food and provide um, smaller fragments so that the others can eat. And although all of them like starch and, res and resistant starch, some of them prefer some, of, um, some better tasting or um, more delicate kind of fibers that are found in other root um, vegetables like onions, leeks, um, scallions, um, things like that. And lignans. Lignans are very powerful. They become anti-inflammatory in body um, after being transformed by our gut microbiota. So keep in mind these names, allostypes, uh, putridinus, and bacteria as well as. There's a really neat study where they, put co they cohabited um, mice. They had obese mice um, and lean mice. Um, these were taken from humans that were discordant human twins for obesity. One was lean, one was thin. So they had put them into mice. And you could see, after cohabiting for a number of days, um, they had an invasion of the lean microbiota. They came directly in, and it was Bacteria's vulgatus and Allostypes putridus, putridinus. So these, this is an obesity study, and it's not a gut-derived disease state, but yet we can see improvement will, um, by just by changing the microbiota, we can, um, we can change the phenotype really radically. And you can see the obese are missing the ancestral core. Um, of course, I like uh, fecal uh, microbiota transplants. They also illustrate the same thing. If someone is sick with C. diff colitis, they're missing all, because of antibiotics, it's an antibiotic-induced condition, they're missing all the ancestral core. They, they are missing a lot of clostridia, clostridia clusters uh, four and, uh, four, 14A, and a lot of the ba bacterioids. And at day uh, one of the donor, you can see he's very rich in um, butyrate-producing um, bacterioides. And by 14, with the succession into day 33, you see firm establishment of a, a member of the cluster 14A, which is um, part of the core, and uh, a big butyrate producer, the cluster 4 urmonococcus and bacterioids. So when we have dysbiosis, um, my seven steps helps um, many things. It doesn't help everything. So with um, sophisticated testing, we can go further. But the first is to introduce fermented foods, which are rich in um, a lot of our ancestral core, like lactobacillus and uh, bacillus subtilis and other ones. And then feeding them with good fiber um, and resistant starch. Um, Soil-based probiotics are really um, great. Unfortunately, a lot of the members that I talked about, like Roseburia and um, um, F. presnalsi, they're not in a bottle at this time. So we need to still have whole foods from um, healthy gardens. But in the meantime, we have SBO probiotics, and we also have bionic fiber, which is made with a higher dose of these um, bionic fibers. And exercise really helps because it doubles, actually, our beauty rate, um, just the movement. Um, we want to avoid GMOs because they have a lot of gut disruption in, in, their, um, in the chemicals they secrete. And in many ways, we have to support the thyroid, gut, and adrenal glands because these are all inter, inter, interlinked. But for others, they need more sophisticated testing. And fortunately, we have a lot of functional medicine testing that can look at organic acids that are spewing into our bloodstream um, and into our urine to help uh, elucidate. And in many ways, we can also look at what clostridia, bacterioids, lactobacillus, and bifida are, um, are present. So hopefully, by looking at our gut and just doing a few simple steps, you'll be able to avoid this the need for this product. It's called Poo Puri. I saw it on my YouTube the other day. It's really funny. But you spray it into your toilet bowl so you don't smell anything. But actually, if you have a really healthy gut, you won't have epic farts. You know, um, you're, 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 you're literally, your, your feces should smell like compost, like, like mine on a good day. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. All right, so our next talk is going to start in four minutes. So this is the time to go to Bancroft if you're going to go there or go to the restroom.
If you have questions, we can take maybe two or three questions and we'll alternate between these. Hello? Is this on? Um, so uh, you just very briefly touched on uh, tests at the very end about uh, establishing your gut health. Um, what would you recommend, and um, is it good for somebody who's already more or less healthy to see it anyway, to see if there's anything there? Personally, because I'm so into the gut, and I think there's just been so much devastation over the last few decades and generations, um, I think it's, it should be part of everyone's physical, to be honest, because we sometimes don't show signs, um, just like the IBD um, during weaning and childhood, they ha didn't have very many signs, prob likely. Um, and some, some things probably can be caught really early. So yeah, I hope that answered your question. Go ahead. Okay, so the gut and fermented foods are my pet topic in this movement. So I'm very happy to have seen your talk. I have very much been interested in knowing how we could see what the prehistoric gut had in it, in the way of bacteria. So I liked that you mentioned the fossilized poop and the frozen mummy. And so what I'm wondering is, how do we know that the bacteria that we find in that didn't come in later? Wait, say the last part again? I'm sorry. So you said we found bacteria in fossilized poop. How did we know that it didn't recolonize later? Or is it I, I think the, the body was intact, um, uh, most likely, yeah. But they did try to um, minus out contaminants because that was really common. Yeah, that's a big challenge. Um, some samples had composted, you know, apparently, and they, they weren't useful. That's a very good question. Thank you for your um, attention. Thanks. Okay. Yep. So I had an interesting experience recently where I was in the southwest standing next to a canyon, and I just had this urge to lick the rock. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know how legitimate that is. Maybe it was like a mineral deficiency or something. But it makes me wonder... A couple things. One, can we crave sources of healthy bacteria? And two, you know, you mentioned um, maintaining healthy gardens to maintain like a healthy gut flora community. And I, th I think that speaks to the value of maintaining wild spaces, whether in our backyards or national parks or whatever. And so my other question, so can we crave healthy bacteria? And secondly, uh, to what extent can we actually just pick around and forage to make an appreciable difference on our own gut flora? Okay, the second question I have, I don't know. I'd, I'd love to have studies so we can see, oh, how much, you know, dirt that we mouth will make a big difference for us. And um, you, you spoke about pica. Pica is actually a clinical nutritional diagnosis um, where people are low and they crave things. But I'd like to um, elicit the thoughts of Seth Roberts for just a second because he was so into the um, flavor of unami, um, that salty, you know, animal carnivore flavor of fermented foods, which are all produced by our bacteria and, and wild yeast. And... Um, I do think we crave that because we have had this intimate co-evolution um, with the co-CEOs in our gut for just hundreds of millions of years, you know. Um, and I think they've instilled that into us, yeah, into our brain. But thank you for your questions. Okay, last question. Thank you so much for your lecture. It was really informative. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, in the beginning slide, you talked about all these different conditions, um, autoimmune conditions. Um, what percent of those do you think are related to the bacterial translocation um, through like a leaky gut? Oh, I would say probably 100%. Okay. Uh, studies are all coming out. They, they're SIBO or SIFO, um, mm -hmm. small intestinal fungal um, overgrowth. Um, right. And there's clear um, breakdown of the barrier. Yeah, if you go into PubMed now, there's so many um, articles now about intestinal permeability, and that's all about microbial translocation. Right. And they find these organisms on the, on the organ or in the organ um, because we're connected by lymph and the lymph nodes too. Right, and I've seen a lot of people um, recommending to rotate the probiotics that you're taking. Yeah, there's so many ways. You could pulse them, high dose, take a break, do random. I think anything that emulates our ancestral intakes is all good, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Bray.